Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, um, I should say that castle building is a big topic. Um, so I, I've had to be quite selective in these talks, but uh, so I regret to say that if anyone were thinking of starting to build on the basis of what they hear from me today, um, their faces would be disappointed, I'm afraid. Think of it more as a taster. However, for those who do wish to pursue things a little further, help is at hand because a few years ago I wrote a book on this very subject, which has recently been published in paperback. I gleaned from the blurb that it is superbly detailed, it is also a fascinating read, and I have uncovered apparently some fascinating facts. Um, and my favourite quotation, this volume is the best book on castles for some time. So the only thing to add is that if anyone is interested, um, I have a very few books with me that I might be persuaded to sell at a, uh, at a large discount. Right, now the um, business is out of the way, uh, let us begin. The sighting of most Norman castles was strategic, to control communications or hold down the rich lands or to contain centres of population. For a fortress, there were also tactical considerations. But the strategic location meant compromises might have to be made. Dover guards the main route to and from the continent, but is also blessed with a formidable site, very probably an Iron Age hill fort, which dominates the town and port and is protected by sheer cliffs to the north and steep slopes to the east and west. The Tower of London which controlled the city, the Thames, and the mainland route to the north is not on a particularly advantageous site tactically, but it nestled within the southeast corner of the Roman fortifications and was further protected to the south by the river. Rochester, which commanded a crossing over the Medway, sits on nothing more um, advantageous than a, a modest eminence above the river, although the river itself was again a source of security. Strategic position apart, various qualities commended themselves to, to, to a castle builder. A high point provided vistas across the surrounding countryside and or townscape. It also allowed a castle to be seen by others and warned off undesirables. At the same time, it promoted the prestige and power of the castle's lord. The site also needed to be defensible. Ideally, the, topo the topography should allow only one readily accessible line of approach. Thus, a spur or promontory, the entrance to which could be controlled by cutting a ditch across the neck was a commonly favoured site. These qualities are present at Montgomery here, which in 1222 was recommended by Henry III's advisors as an apt location for an impregnable castle. Walkworth in Northumberland also occupies a spur, but it guards access to a little peninsula within a loop of the River Coquette on which the accompanying settlement was established. A tower on the Mott would have provided views across the surrounding countryside and coast, and the river, of course, made its own contribution to defence. Such sites vary enormously in their elevation, but in relatively flat landscapes, only a little rise could be advantageous especially if it was within a wetland area, as at Ravensworth here in Yorkshire, where a slightly raised spur was largely surrounded by a marsh, or where there was a water supply that might be exploited, about which more later. A few, most early castles were, were, were timber, the superstructures of which have almost entirely disappeared leaving only the company earthworks. They consisted of one or more enclosures. Some had mots, others didn't. The, uh, the former are sometimes known, the ones that didn't are known as rimworks, the latter as mots and baileys. 
Mott vary widely in size. This is Castle Hill, Thetford, one of the biggest, probably built in, uh, by Roger Bygod in the late 11th century. Little is known about it, and despite the effort that must have gone into its construction, it was never knowingly of much importance. The base, the base has a diameter of around 300 feet, and the mound has a height of about 80 feet. A few attempts have been made at calculating how long it took to build a mot. One of these concerns Castle Neroche in Somerset, where based on the volume of the mound, it has been calculated that a 100 strong workforce putting in 12 hour days would have taken at least four to six months to raise it. Similarly, it has been suggested that constructing the larger mot of Bramber in Sussex would have taken a similar sized workforce working 10 hour days at least nine months. Like any large infrastructure project, we can't always rely too much on the estimates. I suspect these, as usual, are underestimates, but they do su suggest that building a lot was a major undertaking requiring a sustained building campaign and a large number of workers. Most mots were round and when they were raised on a flat surface, were probably laid out, uh, pro probably laid out as a circle. Knock a stake into the ground, tie it to a length of cord representing the radius, and then delineate the, the circumference with further pegs. The assumption is that once the parameters of the mot had been defined, it was built using material from the excavation of the surrounding ditch suggesting that the dimensions of one, or the mass of one, determined that of the other. That may have been the case sometimes, but not always. The ditch at Bramber, for example, doesn't seem to have had the capacity to supply more than 70% of the material in the mot, so there must have been another source. Also, rather than simply throwing up the material from the ditch excavation, there is some evidence for a more systematic approach to mock construction. Here we have the well-known illustration from the bio tapestry showing the mot at Hastings under, under construction, which seems to imply that it was built up in a series of well-defined horizontal layers. So far, it hasn't been possible to say whether this illustration depicts the true nature of the Hastings mot or whether it simply stems from the imagination of the artist. However, some support for such a building technique has been found elsewhere. This is the Mott of York Castle, founded in 1068 or 1069, surmounted by the mid-13th century keep Clifford's Tower. In 1903, when Clifford's Tower was underpinned, the opportunity was taken to record the stratigraphy of the lot. Like the bio-tapestry depiction of its Hastings counterpart, the York Mott seemed to consist of a series of horizontal layers of soil. Directly across the River Ouse is the other York Castle, now represented by its Mott, Vale Hill. Again, 1068 or 1069, we don't know which the two came first. Limited excavation at the base of the mot in the 1960s also suggested a system of horizontal layering. Another example of such a technique is to be found at Carisbrook on the Isle of, on the Isle of Wight, a castle that was in existence by 1086. The Carysbrook Mott was sectioned in the 1890s and at this point was found to consist of a layer of stones on top of which were alternate layers of loose and rammed chalk. Horizontal layering then was one technique, but at least one other method of mock construction has been recorded in excavations. At Dudley in Staffordshire, shown here, which dates from soon after 1071, sorry, which, which was in existence by 1086, 
a ring of clay was constructed first, and then the centre filled in with limestone rubble, and finally the mound was capped with more clay. The clay ring acted as a revetment for the loose material, and so ensured the stability of the mott. A similar method was used in building the mott at Stafford, which dates from soon after 1071, though here, the, hollow, the central hollow was filled in with deposits of material identical to that of the outer ring. It was no doubt a question of what local materials were available. Clay ring formations such as these were constructed in much the same way as contemporary ring works, from which they were probably derived. This is Moor Castle in Shropshire, where there is a low mound which excavation suggests represents the conversion of a late 11th century ring work or enclosure into a mott in the early in the 12th century. Motts are numerous, but more universal are the defences of the main ensemble, normally consisting of a bank and ditch. Sometimes, at least, the construction of a bank was carried out with considerable care. At Hendomen, the predecessor to Montgomery, the preliminary task was to level up a sloping site by building a, a low bank along the line of the proposed rampart to provide a, ba a level base for a series of clay pads, interpreted by the excavators as bases for posts. Um, here, along this section of the defences. <coughs> the, um, the, the posts were representative of a timber frame skeleton for a rampart which was then built around it. Hendomen has so far proved to be an exception. Most excavated earthworks have not produced evidence for associated timber work. But as with Mott's, there are indications of a systematic approach. Section of a number of castle banks, dating from the 11th century onwards, has produced evidence that, preparatory to, to building the bank itself, a low marking out bank was raised first. Here at um, Odium in Hampshire um, is one labelled uh, period one bank. Excavation of the um, excavation of the outer earthwork at Porchester um, in Hampshire, probably uh, which probably dates from the 14th century, produced evidence for a marker bank of turf and topsoil labelled ten on the right hand side of the um, of the section. It was situated about five metres from the edge of the ditch and marking the approximate centre line of the rampart. So some calculation of volume must have been made and the line of the marker bank positioned accordingly. Excavation of the 11th century Bailey Bank at Stafford also produced some evidence for a marker bank. Otherwise, it consists of a series of marl dumps all deposited from outside to inside, and thus, possibly, and thus, thus probably deposited simultaneously with the excavation of the ditch. The ditch is now 30 feet below the level of the bailey, so in the later stages, there was either some kind of mechanical hoist to haul the earth up to the bank, or it was thrown up in stages, perhaps onto a series of temporary platforms. These earthworks of loose material must have been revetted in some way to prevent, to prevent um, slumping. Some, issue, some instances of uh, timber revetment have been noted in excavation, but turfing was probably the principal method for castle earthworks. Certainly it was used here at Carnarvon in the late 13th century for the town defences. Most castle ditches were dry, or perhaps only periodically wet, owing to the water-retaining qualities of the subsoil. 
But some had the advantage of being near a watercourse that could be used to add to the defensibility of the site. This is Burke Hampstead, uh, a Mott and Bailey built for Robert Count of Morte, one of the earliest of English castles with a wet moat. It's unusual in having a double ditch system. Both, uh, both ditches were wet, being fed from the north by a, by a stream, which was di diverted through them uh, and discharged into the river Bullbourne to the south. A little more complicated than the usual moat system, which perhaps called for a particular expertise. In that respect, the Doomsday Entry is of great interest in recording the pres presence the, the presence there of a Fusarius or Diker who, one would like to think, was there to construct and or maintain the wet ditch system. Such men, uh, such men came from, often came from wet areas like the English Fens or the Netherlands and they were in demand in later years because water supplies were fickle and it took a specialist to keep the water topped up. Control of the water system was usually achieved by damming a natural watercourse to make a more extensive feature in the moment. That was the case at Kenilworth, built in the 1120s on a, on a modest eminence overlooking the confluence of two streams, which provided the inspiration for an ambitious water management scheme. A dam was built across the stream to the south, and the encirclement of the castle with water achieved by cutting a ditch to the north. An expert was probably also at hand at Caerphilly, where Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Hereford and Gloucester, began to build a new castle in the 1260s. It was another promontory site, uh, but rather than isolating it from the high ground by a single ditch, it was divided in by three ditches into three separate areas which became islands in the waterscape that was to be developed by Gilbert de Clare's engineers. As at Kenilworth, there were two streams, one each side of the promontory. The initial stage was to build a dam across the, step, across the stream to the south of the eastern island and to raise a bank on the north side of the promontory to contain the water on that side. At a later date, the dam was extended to the north to, to create a second lake. Uh, moving swiftly on from the infrastructure, infrastructure to, uh, to the superstructures, one site that has produced some significant evidence is Tamworth, where a section of the Bailey defences was investigated in the 1970s. Here, there doesn't seem to have been a bank but um, a row of post holes was discovered along the edge of the bailey and on the ledge at a slightly lower level a double row of post holes. <coughs> there were transverse alignments of these three lines of post holes at regular intervals suggesting that the three rows were linked by cross members as, as at Hen Domen in order to create a stable structure. The scarp of the ditch had been deliberately shaped to accommodate the timber work, the upper part at an angle of 45 degrees, which suggested to the excavator that passing braces at this angle held the, um, held the, the different parts of the timber work together. And there's passing brace. Passing braces are certainly known to have been in existence by the late 12th century, and it's quite possible that they, have, they are a much older technique. The whole construction would have provided a defensive barrier with a war walk behind. Another important site is, uh, is the Moffat Abinger. In a phase dating from around 1150, large numbers of post holes were discovered on the summit, representing two main timber elements a central building interpreted by the excavator as a tower, and two rows around the perimeter, which were interpreted as a palisade and the support for an associated war walk. Thus, the reconstruction. Um, as far as the double, post, uh, double ring of posts is concerned, we should infer that in... <coughs> 
that in order to achieve structural stability, the two elements must have been joined together, as at Tamworth, to form elements of a single frame structure. Uh, most castles had timber superstructures, but some were in stone from the outset, including Ludlow, of course. If you were building on rock, as at Beeston, there was a ready-made foundation as well as an immediate source of stone. Here it came from the Great Ditch, excavated in front of the inner ward. Indeed, unless price was not a particular issue, then as much stone as possible was local though ashlar for coins and dressings might have to be transported from further afar at a much higher cost. <clears throat> a Roman site like Colchester could be, uh, could be plundered for building materials to offset the expense. In the case of the keep, a bonus came from citing it over the vaulted podium of a Roman temple, but the heavily stratified plot meant digging deep foundations for the outer walls. The bottom of the footings is 12 feet below the base of the splayed plinth, and the lowest course consists of a concrete mix of stone and water poured into a slot or trench. Above this are 20 courses of masonry, the quality of the workmanship improving in stages as the wall rose. Rochester is another Roman site. In fact, the entire south wall of the keep, around 1130, uses the wall of the Roman settlement as a foundation. The foot of the Norman foundations has not been located, but excavations in the early 20th century showed that the walls extended some 14 feet below ground floor level. Rochester was an exceptional building that needed exceptional foundations, but the footings for less ambitious structures could be comparatively slight. At Walkworth here, foundations for the South Curtain Wall beneath its inner face were cut only six inches into the clay subsoil and had a total depth of one and a quarter feet. <coughs> Many of the masonry practices of early castle builders have their origins in those of the ancient Romans. We are now at Dewey La Fontaine, the Thulbach Valley, a late Carolingian hall converted into a tower around 900. It incorporates a distinctive form of, stone, of, of rubble stonework, known in this country as herringbone masonry, but which seems to be a less formal derivative of the Roman opus picatum. Flat stones were laid at an angle of approximately 45 degrees, stability being ensured by alternating the, the direction of pitch from course to course to give a zigzag pattern. It appears in numerous 11th century castles in England and is generally indicative of an early date. Sticking with the uh, Loire Valley for the moment, another early keep is at Langer, possibly built for Faulkner, Count of Anjou. It dates from, from around 1000, and although it contains some good quality freestone in the coins and buttresses, the greater part is faced with rubble, but rubble of a particular character. Known in France as Petit Taparai, it consists of uh, small, roughly squared stones laid in re regular courses to produce a uniform facade and give a more accomplished finish an ordinary rubble walling. In castle building, this technique usually predates the 12th century. There are examples in Britain, though not many. The 11th century keep at Colchester is one example. <coughs> More certainly built for Fulknera, the Great Tower of Loche is probably a little later than Loche, between uh, Dendrochronology is dated to between 1015 and 1030. Uh, the building in the foreground is uh, a 15th century gatehouse. It's the two block tower behind that we're interested in. Uh, Losh is one of the earliest tower keeps and a, a real prestige job. 
Whereas Langer used ashlar only in the coins of buttresses, Lache is entirely faced with ashlar, rare for a building at this date and a considerably more expensive choice. In England, the use of ashlar for facing entire stories didn't occur in castles till about 1100. All three of these French towers are pierced by putlock holes into which the scaffolding poles are set. A gridiron pattern like this isn't uncommon. It represents several lists, lifts of the working platform which tend to range between waist height and chest height. This is one of several medieval illustrations showing this kind of scaffolding. Uh, the picture also shows uh, a crane. We sometimes hear people speculating upon how medieval buildings could have coped without machinery. But of course they didn't. A lot of work was done by hand, but there was plenty of lifting machinery. We see it time and again in medieval il illustrations. This one has pincer attachments to lift heavy blocks into place, place. This one is powered by a treadmill. And here we have hand-operated pulley systems. Such devices appear so frequently that they must have been in general usage. As the walls went up, various openings and apertures had to be accommodated within them. Doors, windows, staircases and passages. Some might be vaulted in stone, but a quicker and cheaper method was to use a concrete mix. Raise the wall to the required height and then construct timber formwork on which to lay the mortar. Wattle frameworks were sometimes used, but also planks the impressions of which sometimes remain in the solidified mortar, as here at Loche in this window embrasure. At Rochester, over a passage, and again, over staircases at Rochester and Orford. <clears throat> Larger spaces might be vaulted in stone, but it wasn't common usage until the 12th century. Chapels, however, were exceptions to the rule. This is an early example of English barrel vaulting of the late 11th century chapel at Richmond Castle. The technique is fairly straightforward. Build an arched timber structure in the proposed form of the vault, lay the stonework on top and pile on the concrete to provide a level surface for the floor above. Um, I'm, I think I've come to the end of my talk now. I've got to come, come, come a bit, I've spoken a bit more quickly than I expected, but, um, but I'm open to questions. Thanks, Malcolm. Very interesting. So clearly the castles have similarities, but also differences based on geography and needs. My question to you is, in terms of architectural design and building, was there a group of people who went around to different castles offering advice, or was it all locally done? I mean, was there a blueprint that people then varied, and did people travel around to advise, or was it all done locally by different people? Uh, we, well, we don't know much about the we don't know much about the early period. Um, there, there are named occasional names of uh, masons and other workmen um, who were in charge. Uh, <coughs> um, one of the best known examples is Horace the Engineer, who worked at uh, uh, Newcastle and at Dover. Um, so he was somebody who travelled around in the, uh, working on, on the Royal Works. Um, I suspect that m most people, I, I, well, there, there were certainly specialists, I think, um, going, about, going about the landscape um, like a, a medieval um, Lancelot Brown and assessing the capabilities of the science. Um, and certainly from the later period, we know there were, there were masons with kind of very large practices who travelled quite widely, yes. Thank you very much. Michael Rosenbaum, member of the Mortimer Society.
society. Um, Bishop Gradelon is a name that perhaps we could add into the mix. He was the, um, although he was a bishop, he was appointed effectively as the architect and project manager for Rochester Castle, right. and then subsequently Colchester, which you um, illustrated in terms of the Hemingway, um, sorry, in terms of the, 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 the pug um, type of structure, and also the famous White Tower in the Tower of London. Um, so maybe it was people like that who had education um, with, and experience within France before William came over, who William then appointed to senior positions, um, what we would call today project managers. But my question is actually um, to do with the, the, with the mots. Um, I was, I, I'm always intrigued by the, um, the figures which show very steep-sided slopes to the ramparts on which the mots sit. Um, and you mentioned um, rubble being used in the interior of these, which seems eminently sensible because it would be local material that was probably too poor quality to be used for anything else, and it was free draining, which is one of the great problems that, um, that the engineers face when they're constructing with soil. But what really took my notice was the layer of clay around the outside. Now, clay is notorious material, especially when it gets wet from the point of view of low strength and low stability. And I wondered if there was a, a, a reason from a military point of view of why the clay would have been used as, as, as effectively a surface layer for the rampart. Because as an engineer, I wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think it's a question of if, uh, what was available on site. Um, and in a, in a a clay area like Stafford, you had clay to dig out of the ditch. Am I, am I, am I right, Malcolm, in thinking that, uh, that you know, there are examples of subsidence um, and, and, and castles uh, just slipping and, and then having to be rebuilt? Um, I, 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 can't, uh, I can't think of any. I can, add, I can add at least three examples. <laughs> Just, 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 just to sort of help you out there, um, Vermont at York has a, a classic failure on, on, on the structure, um, and Hadley Castle in Essex is half collapsed as a result of the sliding of the foundations. I could go on, but it's not my lecture. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the keep on top of the uh, Moss at York has, it, has indeed um, uh, suffer damage from subsidence. Um, then I suppose initially it was never meant to be there. There would have been a timber um, timber structure on top of York Mott. And as far as I know, it's only happened because the, the, the extra weight laid on top of it. Uh, if I could comment on that, if you use granular material for the, on the outside of a, a mot, you can't get an, uh, a slope of more than about 35 or 40 degrees at the most. That's the a angle of rest. So you have to use clay uh, to, to actually get a steeper slope on the outside. Right. right. And See, the, the question I was going to ask is, uh, is there any evidence where you've got uh, successive uh, layers in the construction mot that the, each of the, some of these layers represent the end of a construction season, so it was built over three or four years. It's, um, it's uh, I, well, it's uh, something to think about, so <laughs> it's a possibility, I suppose. Uh, can I ask, Malcolm, how much did a castle cost? Who financed it? And what proportion of income was the investment made by those who built them? Um, well, it could be. <laughs> It could be anything, really. I mean, I, I, I find that quite a, a difficult question to answer. Um, I don't have those sorts of figures at my fingertips. But would there be some examples of slave labour, for example, captain labour? Um, well, I think the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons had a, um, I suppose you might call it slave labour, but they had a, a, an obligation to work on uh, military works, so which the Normans took advantage of. So, but they would have been paid to a point. 
the third, the third me, as, as the Normans took over areas, um, then the local population would have had little, uh, little, little, op little opportunity to resist uh, being, in, being forced into labour uh, on, on the castle. Um, the question I was going to ask was um, in relation to, again, to the workforce and the fact that, um, you know, it took, say, 100 men a certain number of months to, to, to build a mosque. <coughs> Is there evidence of them living close by to the site? And also, how were they protected whilst they were building it? Because if it's a defensive site, presumably <coughs> there are concerns that, you know, that there are going to be hostile forces in the area. Um, uh, but as far as I'm aware, there isn't any evidence to, as, as to where they lived. Um, occasionally, uh, uh, a, bit, a building from um, re recovered from excavation has been identified as a, a mason's lodge, but um, it's, um, it's a difficult thing to um, ascertain. Um, I, I'm not aware of uh, workmen's camps having knowingly been discovered. Um, in, in, in a, well, we don't know about the early Norman period, but um, we do know about Edward the First's um, invasion of Wales, where the uh, the immediate um, the immediate action was to build a. <coughs> Um, the camp, um, the bank and ditch around it, and a timber palisade while the stone castle was being built that, to house the equipment and the workforce and so on. Okay, uh, <coughs> thanks very much, Malcolm. Thank you indeed. Thank you.